Today is March 31st, 2019. My name is Alex Valdez and I'm interviewing Professor Stanley Bittinger for the Voces Oral History Project. We are sitting here at Professor Bittinger's home in Kingsville, Texas. Professor Bittinger, thank you for sharing your perspective with us. As we already explained, your interview will be housed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection. Uh, please know that if there is anything you do not wish to talk about, you do not have to. And if there is anything you do want to talk about that I, that I do not ask about, please feel free to interject. Okay? Yes. Let's get started. <laughs> so, uh, first just tell us a little bit what your life was like growing up. I know you lived in a lot of different places, like even like Nigeria. So tell us what those experiences were like for you. Well, it was a very small boy. They took me out with my parents, went to Nigeria in the central uh, upstate part of Nigeria, away from the ocean, in, um, in an area similar to Texas, uh, and it was somewhat drier, although they had a rainy season. So I grew up there from age two, and I played around a lot with the Nigerian boys and girls, and I learned to speak Bura, a language of a tribe that my parents were working with, and they established some schools and uh, translated the the language that had never been written down into letters and cr pr printed out primers and school books and taught the folks to read in their own language. And uh, I grew up in that environment where there were, my parents were educators and schools working in established schools in rural communities. And so we often took safari trips on horseback and off many miles away from where our home was and camped out many nights in order to uh, visit villages and get them to establish schools. And we came back to the United States in 1938. I was about 10 years old. And then I had to readjust to going to school um, in the United States. and. Um, live in an environment that was somewhat more modern than what we had in Nigeria. And uh, so we went, I was, my dad was working on some degrees at the University of Pennsylvania. We lived in Philadelphia. And then later when he got his degree, we moved to Kansas. And my father was teaching at the small college there in McPherson, Kansas. So I went to high school there, started high school. Then later we moved to uh, Elgin, Illinois. I graduated from high school in Elgin. Went to uh, college in Indiana, to a church college, a place called Manchester College. And I graduated in 1959. And um, it was a degree in sociology and chemistry. And uh, I married my wife, I met my wife in college. She was a college graduate, the head of the class. And uh, then that <clears throat> we did our senior year together as a married couple. And then after uh, I graduated from college, I went to the University of Notre Dame for a year, working on a master's degree in sociology. And then I volunteered for three years. My wife and I volunteered for three-year program in uh, volunteer workers in Puerto Rico. So we'd studied Spanish in college, but uh, going to Puerto Rico, we had to learn to become more fluent. And I worked at a community center in the rural part of Puerto Rico for three years. We had a hospital and a high school and a community center. And uh, I worked in all three, and my wife did too. And our two sons were born there. And uh, we had Stephen and Craig were born there. And we got birth certificates in Spanish for them. And uh, it was different. They had a different way of using the last name. And so it uh, has always been a little bit of a hassle for them to prove their biddingers rather than soy hearts. <laughs> because they put my wife's name last in the a, in a Puerto Rican birth certificates. And so we, uh, we came back in uh, about 19, 
54 to the United States, and then I went to University of Chicago for a year, working on a doctor's degree in um, sociology, and then uh, they, I was invited to come to South Texas because of our knowledge of Spanish and work with migrant workers in Falfurius. So we uh, came to Falfurius where our, we had a church. Our, our church group was the Church of the Brethren and did a lot of service projects. And uh, so we came there and worked with migrant workers and supported ourselves by teaching in the local high school. My wife taught fifth grade and I taught in the high school. They put me to work teaching American history and chemistry. And uh, so I taught there three years and then went from there to University of Texas to get my PhD degree. And uh, after several years, we, I came to, uh, I went one year and taught at um, Texas Tech in Lubbock and then came to Kingsville. We wanted to be doing more in South Texas. And uh, so we came here and I started teaching at Kingsville at the A&I University in 1963. And then I stayed here doing that for 30 years, retired in 93. And uh, I was became assistant professor and then eventually became full professor and then department chair in sociology. And uh, then we had a graduate program in bilingual ed at the university and I taught several courses for the doctoral program in bilingual ed before I retired. I retired in about 1994, uh, 95, something like that. And uh, since I retired, I've, we continue to live here and uh, participate in activities here and in Falfurius. I kind of want to, kind of a long answer to a short question. No problem. <laughs> I kind of want to go back a little bit and talk about um, your childhood again. You grew up in Nigeria, then you moved to America again afterwards. So what was the difference like in the schooling? Um, between, like, so, for example, like schooling in Nigeria and school in America once again, what was the biggest difference for you? Well, I went to school a little bit with the Nigerian kids, and it was, uh, we had a uh, mud adobe building with a grass roof, and we sat in uh, on mud benches, and the teacher would write stuff on the blackboard. And uh, we would learn the ABCs and how to read and write. But then uh, the missionary group that was there decided maybe some of the, we needed to be educated also in English. So when we came back to the States, the transition would be easier. So then one of the missionary wives began to teach us. So it was more like homeschooling. And we learned then to do reading and writing in English, as well as read, reading and writing in Bura. And uh, so it was a very small school, a half a dozen of us that were children learning there. And then coming to school here, they weren't sure where we belonged. So they gave us some tests and started us out in about the fourth grade. And uh, then a year or so later, they advanced me to the sixth grade, and I skipped fifth. So I had learned enough that I could move ahead in some areas, but not in others. And so talking more about your parents too, i um, guessing your parents were pretty passionate about you getting your education, even as a young child. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, they believed very much in education, and they wanted both, the, all of the children, their children. There were four of us, and uh, they did everything they could to help us get all the education we could. And we had them as, as role models. And uh, my father and mother were both very uh, good teachers. And a lot of students uh, admired them. We, kind of, we had lots of college students around in the house. 
as we were growing up. And uh, so we wanted to go to college and, and learn as much as we could. But uh, there was always this emphasis on, uh, we had lived among the Nigerians and learned their language. And we came to the States and, and uh, perfected our English. And uh, we're still very much involved in learning about other language groups in the United States. And my mother was a linguist. She spoke French and English and German. And uh, she set a good example to want us to learn to communicate in other languages as well as English. So I think it's obvious that education was a huge thing in your home growing up. Yes. Um, what about religion? What were your parents' views on religion and how did they kind of teach you all about that? Well, they were very religious. Um, they grew up in uh, deeply religious communities, both my mother and father. And um, they had a religious wedding and they were working as missionaries with a religious, in a religious setting. And my father was a very effective minister and preacher. People came from all over to hear him preach. And my mother taught language, uh, uh, children's groups in, in, uh, for, like, for Bible study, and religious education for children. And uh, when they came back, although he was a college teacher, he was asked every Sunday to go somewhere and preach. So we would all go along. So I had all my father's sermons memorized. I could say them for him. And uh, the, uh, he continued to be involved in church work and at not only at the local level, but district and national. He served on a lot of national committees, and church organization as a denomination. And then he became the editor of the church uh, newspaper, a church magazine. And so he did a lot of writing in his later years. And then, uh, <clears throat> so he was very involved in religion. He, um, after he retired as a college professor, he got a job as dean of the ship called the World Campus Afloat. And um, it was a group, it was a ship for about 500 students with classrooms and laboratories and a library plus uh, sleeping quarters for 500 students. And they went around the world, stopped at different countries for a week and did field trips ashore to get to know local communities. And journalism students would talk with newspaper people in each country get different slant on things. And uh, biology students would do field trips to look at animals and plants of each different country they stopped at. And so they did a half a dozen trips around the world. And my dad set up the curriculum and, and uh, lectured as they went while they were traveling on the seas as well as ashore. So they, it was a very interesting experience for them. But as my dad got to visiting with religious groups in India and uh, China, his uh, focus got more global. And so he became quite familiar and friends with church religious leaders in India and China, the, the Confucius kind of philosophy and all the various Hindu and Buddhist philosophies in the Indian area. And so he, he got more and more of an anthropological approach to religion, which I sort of inherited, that I was teaching here in courses in sociology and anthropology. And uh, uh, I was very much interested in religious aspect of ancient cultures as well as modern day peoples. So I, I like to do a lot of, I continued my father's interest in uh, 
the religions of the world. And did you ever take part of one of those trips around the world? Did you ever? Yes, one year I, I went with them, taught courses in sociology as we went around the world and I helped my mother, we did some research, took questionnaires on the students' attitudes, trying to measure their uh, growth in uh, away from ethnocentrism to a more global view as they went around and visited other cultures. So we did a beginning series of surveys and then toward the end of the trip we followed up with another set of surveys so that they could, uh, we could measure any kind of change that might have taken place. So it was interesting to see the effect on the students of a global education instead of a narrow uh, focused education in just one community. So kind of shifting gears here, I know you, I mean, like we've been talking about, you grew up in a lot of different environments. Um, when was the first time you were exposed to Mexican Americans, Latinos, Hispanics growing up? And what was your knowledge of them back then? Well, my first contact with the Hispanics was in Puerto Rico. And uh, I had taken a lot of Spanish classes in high school. And our teacher had traveled a lot in Spain and in Mexico. And it created a lot of interest I had from the beginning in uh, the cultures of Mexico and, and Spain and their appreciation for their contributions to world civilization. But in Puerto Rico then I, I was able to participate in and observe a lot of local um, culture acts. I learned a lot from the people in Puerto Rico. But I was interested in, became interested in the acculturation process that uh, Puerto Rico had become a part of the United States in 1898, the Spanish-American War. They'd been exposed to a lot of impact, influence from the U.S. and a lot of Puerto Ricans traveled to New York and Chicago and then back to Puerto Rico. So there was this constant uh, uh, <clears throat> interchange of cultures. So the Puerto Rico's, Puerto Rican people had their own indigenous culture, which had developed out of a mixture of Indians and Spanish. And then there was this American influence. So they had to develop a culture that was a blend of all three. And it was very fascinating to, to learn about. And then I came here to Texas and it was totally different. They laughed at my Puerto Rican accent when I first came here. And some of the words that I'd learned to use in Puerto Rico were considered a bad taste here in Texas. Like what? And so a word like coger was uh, common in Puerto Rico, meaning to grasp, to take a hold of. Cogelo, cogelo, tiramelo, and stuff like that. And then I came here and was using the word coger, and everybody kind of smile and look funny. So I had to learn to say agarrar, agarrelo, instead of cogelo, because that was considered bad. And then with some of my uh, friends from uh, Cuba, we had in Puerto Rico and in parts of Mexico, they a nice fruit called uh, papaya. And we learned to love to eat papaya. But with my Cuban friends, papaya had all sorts of sexual connotations. And they called it fruta bomba instead of uh, papaya. So I had to relearn some Spanish vocabulary to get along in South Texas. And uh, I was very much, the more I lived here, the more I became fascinated with learning about the cultures of Mexico and then observing the the acculturation process along the border, that uh, the language, that, especially that they spoke at, along the border, the dialecto fronterizo, was uh, a blend of ancient Aztec and Spanish and uh, English and, and other, other influences. 
so that it's a very interesting mixture of very special dialect. And uh, apparently in Spain there had been a group of uh, travelers, uh, people like uh, the gypsies and other people who carried freight from one town to another. And they were called in Spain the arreros, the arreara, the teamsters who traveled. And they were always on the road and they developed a language of their own. And so it was called Caló. And a lot of the, the arreros would carry freight from Mexico City to El Paso. And they had a big settlement in El Paso and they constantly back and forth with mule teams carrying stuff. And so in El Paso and along the border, the, that language, the caló of the travelers, the, the teamsters, was uh, widespread. And it's a special kind of Spanish that wasn't regular standard Spanish, and it wasn't Indian, and it wasn't Gringo. It was, uh, it was mixed in. So the, the uh, words like, for my brother, he's my carnal, is, uh, that comes from calo, and uh, I think pants were the word clamos or something like that. So the that it's it's a very special kind of cultural environment. So from a, for a sociologist and an anthropologist, it's a wonderful place to study how cultures mix and mingle, influence one another. So kind of bouncing off the topic of mixing cultures. Um, you lived through the time when there were segregated schools in America. What was that experience like, like seeing it and then also being an educator and being a student during that time? Well, I was very frustrated and unhappy with that. It seemed to me I'd, I'd gone to school with Nigerians. <laughs> and when we lived in Philadelphia, uh, we lived in a poor section of town. My folks were graduate students. So I went to school with all sorts of people and enjoyed it. And uh, it seemed wrong to segregate people into black schools and Hispanic schools and Anglo schools. So I was unhappy with that from the start. I, I, didn't, I wanted to do everything I could to promote the stopping of segregation and more integration of people. And was there a certain moment when you became aware of racial and ethnic inequities? Yeah, I think right, right from the start in Pennsylvania and in Indiana, Kansas, there was always uh, people looking down on uh, people of darker color and other languages. And uh, I tried to not be a part of that that kind of an environment. Uh, with my parents and with the university connections, I could get away from some of that. But then in school, I wasn't part of the, the in-group because I was uh, different. I think I need to stop for a minute and get a drink of water, if you don't mind. <laughs> My mouth is getting kind of dry. I thought I could get get this one. Any kind of glass, and I can grab it for you if I. There's just there's some plastic cups there on the top. There on that. Uh, no, no, no. Here on the on the counter. Further down toward the end, isn't there some plastic? No, look on the top of the counter. Here with those plastic plates. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's okay. great. And just get some cold water out of the refrigerator there. Yeah, right there, the one on the right. Push in on it. It should be a get to the ice cube there. Oh, you got the water. Good. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. So am I giving you the kind of answers you want, or did you rather I talk about something else? You're doing great. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, where where are we now? <laughs> um, let's keep on let's keep on talking about the inequities. Um, was there like one particular anecdote that you can tell us about? One particular story of maybe discrimination that you saw or witnessed growing up that really stuck with you and that bothered you or made you feel any type of way? Well, when I was in high school in Elgin, the uh, a lot of the young guys in school were there were some Jewish guys, and uh, I kind of liked them. They were interested in education and and some of the same same things I was interested in, and I hung around with the the Jewish young fellows rather than some of the others. And uh, people begin to tease me a little bit about hanging out with these these Jewish guys, but I also hung around a lot with the the black students because I had a natural affinity <laughs> like to like the black students, and uh, so the, my fellow students in in the high school it was a big high school we there were four hundred in my graduating class. And uh, but they they teased me some in in high school about hanging around with the wrong crowd because I was making good grades and uh, my folks were lived in a nice part of town and uh, we were I was eligible to be part of the in group but I, I chose not to be. <laughs> And I hung around with these other folks, and we had a lot of fun together. And then when I went to college, our church college was not, it was open. It was, we had people from foreign countries. And so it was very warm and nice, and we came out of that feeling good. And when I went to uh, the to University of Notre Dame, I was one of the few Protestants in there. Everybody else was Catholic. And they all got up, started the class with the crossing themselves and saying the Hail Mary. And I didn't know the Hail Mary. I hadn't grown up learning that. And I, I had to listen to how they were saying it so I could join in with them to say it. But it was uh, interesting to be a little different. I was the minority and everybody else was the majority that they treated me very nicely and I got a nice degree from them. But um, then when I went to University of Texas, it was the first time I got involved in some activism. There's a main street running right by the university called The Drag or Guadalupe Avenue. And then right across the street from the uh, Student Union building, there was a theater a long time ago when I was there as a student in 58. and. Uh, graduate student, and they wouldn't serve blacks. They wouldn't let blacks go to that theater. And there were a lot of black students, but only white-looking students were allowed to go in there and look at movies. And so they put signs up on some of the bulletin boards, anybody want to participate in a protest, uh, come out to a certain meeting. And so we agreed on a strategy. And so one day we had a the black couple, man and his wife and some little kids all dressed up nice. They came to get tickets to go to see a movie. And then right behind them was a whole bunch of students with money in our hands and we had nice clothes on. And so the lady in the ticket booth said, we can't sell you any tickets. So step aside, I'll take care of the people behind you. And then those of us behind said, no, we're not, we're not going to go in until you let our friend in, our colleague, fellow student. 
And so we'll just wait here until you make up your mind that you can let us all come in. Because we're all students and we're all we've got money in our hand. And so the poor woman in the in the ticket booth didn't know quite what to do. Here was a, a hundred people all lined up with money in their hand. And uh, so she was calling the manager and he was stalling and we sat we stood there for a couple hours before the manager finally decided there was nobody inside looking at the movie. And here are all these paying customers out in the street. And so they finally broke down and let us all come in to watch the movie. So <clears throat> that was my first experience with a demonstration or anti-segregation activity. It was a graduate student at UT. So then when I came here, I was kind of surprised that there was almost no activity among students at first. And it was, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, nobody, everybody seemed scared to want to do anything. And yet there were a lot of examples of segregation all around us. And so after a little while it began to happen. People began hearing about what was happening in other places. And then they began to get more and more activity. So coming out of college, um, when did you know that you wanted to become an educator yourself and what inspired you to do that? Well, two or three things. One it would be, of course, my, my parents had been successful teachers. It, it seemed like a good way to try to make a better world. I'd seen what education could do in Nigeria and other countries. I'd taught in high school at, in Puerto Rico. We, uh, our, where we were, our project was way out in a rural area and the students that graduated from grade school, if they wanted to go to high school, had to go all the way from Castaner clear into Adjuntas and there's about a 20 mile bus ride every day to go to high school. And so it, we had a lot of good students, but no, not many of them could afford the bus ride every day. And so we decided to build a little high school there in Castaner. And so uh, we had buildings and some of us had college degrees and we could be teachers. And so uh, we're in, in Puerto Rico, you're supposed to educate in, in English. But a lot of the students come from homes where Spanish is spoken all the time. So it was hard to get an education in English when your native language was Spanish. And so the, a lot of the teachers would teach in English and Spanish. You'd, they'd have the textbook there and read a little of it, but then you'd explain it in Spanish too. <laughs> so I enjoyed teaching several courses in the high school. It was it was fun and to work with the students and help them to go on and, and learn real well. And so we we had this rural the only rural high school in all of Puerto Rico it was there in Castaneda. And a nice lot of students came in from nearby communities. It wasn't so far to come to Castaneda compared to trying to ride all the way to Juntas. And so we <clears throat> That was fun to do that, and I, I kind of felt, then besides that, I was personally kind of a studious kind of person. I liked to read and learn and keep abreast of changes in the development of the field. And so I, I wanted to be a college teacher, do research and, and teach college students. I thought it would work. I had a couple of years experience teaching over at Falfurius in high school. And I enjoyed that. It was fun and in some cases I had t taught students at Fal and Falfurius. And then later they were in my classes over here in college. And uh, so it was interesting. Uh, were you one of the teachers who would teach in English and in Spanish? Yes. 
And when did you learn Spanish? Because I know you, I know you didn't speak growing up, correct? No, I, I learned some Spanish in high school, and then I was three years in Puerto Rico. It was a learning experience there. And then coming to Falfurius and working with migrant workers, I had a chance to practice a lot. I still don't speak it perfectly, but I enjoy giving it a try. And uh, once I was here teaching, I got started taking field trips to Mexico. And I'd take a group of students and we'd go down, visit ruins and museums and factories and see what's happening down there. Talk to families, get out in the rural communities. And then uh, my sons and I joined the cave exploring club. And we had a speleological society here that uh, would go and explore caves in Mexico. So with weekends when we weren't doing field trips or something, we'd go down, a bunch of us, and uh, talk to, to farmers and uh, shepherds, people that lived in the back country. And they'd tell us where there were caves. And we'd go and explore them. And so we'd, we'd mingle more with the poor people that out in the country and talk Spanish to them and uh, get directions on where to find uh, different caves and then go explore them. It was a good, good thing to do with my sons as they were growing up in high school age. Uh, instead of having them banged up in football or something, I could go do something with them. We'd climb down ladders and slide down ropes and climb back out in, in caves down there. So it was uh, enjoyable, the thing to do for father and sons. Was it important to you that they grew up bilingual? Yes. Yeah, and they enjoyed that. Once they, they, they were still high school students. Once they went to UT as college students, both of them went there. Uh, they joined the Speleological Club in University of Texas. And that's a very well organized outfit a club or activity and they uh, they would go with groups down to Mexico and sometimes serve as interpreters and communicators to talk to the local people. If you want to find caves and directions you need to be able to talk to, to the people that live there and they can tell you where they are. So uh, let's talk about Texas A&I. Um, you're a professor there for a very long time. What kind of class did you teach there, and what kind of activism did you do there as well, too? Well, I taught, came here to, as a sociology professor, and uh, the, uh, they didn't have much in the way of sociology when I came. One or two courses were being offered, and uh, not much in the area of, of the studies of the border area. Texas and, and uh, the Southwest. And it was just a standard course of Sociology 101 and uh, social problems and marriage and the family. And so I got going here to get more courses on the books and get several other professors and begin to build a sociology department. And I was especially interested in it seemed to me that in an area of social change and mixed cultures and segregation, that what the area needed was uh, an intellectual, objective, scientific approach to what understanding what was going on. And so uh, I tried to get study uh, courses on the borderlands and Mexican culture and American culture and borderlands area. So we got several courses going and began accumulating material and research so that we could help students to understand objectively what was happening around them and, and the situation we were in. So I was very much interested in trying to do that. And uh, it took a while. You get a course going, you have to write a syllabus and a prospectus and, get other professors to agree and it has to pass the dean and 
the graduate council and everybody, and then you get the course approved. And then you have to select textbooks and get it going. It can't do that overnight. So you have to play with the local bureaucracy in the school to be able to get more courses, find people that would teach them and that sort of thing. And it was a good learning experience for me. I needed to study a lot to learn more about what was happening. And then I found that a lot of the high school students, I'd taught in high school in Fallon, talked to high school students around. Most students in high schools in South Texas never took a single course that it was about Mexico. They didn't know anything about Mexican history. You talk about Father Miguel Hidalgo or Emiliano Zapata, Pancho Villa, they had heard rumors, but nothing uh, academic, nothing really solid. And uh, so they had all kinds of weird ideas and myths and misinformation about Mexico. So I tried to organize activities that would help people to uh, get a more realistic understanding of what was happening and what was going on in Mexico. A lot of people, for instance, they had the idea when you go to the border, that's where you find prostitutes and cheap liquor. And that was all that they knew about Mexico. You go to Reynosa or Laredo and, and find a woman or find a beer and get drunk that they didn't know anything about interior Mexico. So in my first year here, I got a bunch of students in a bus and we went to Mexico City and uh, we had 40 students or so that went there and went to museums and a bullfight and we saw underground subways and tall skyscrapers and factories and they couldn't think of Mexico then as the land of poor peons, uh, barefooted. Uh, they could see that Mexico had engineers and up-to-date culture, and it, it helped the Anglo students to get more respect for their Hispanic colleagues and helped the Hispanic students to have more pride in, in their own heritage. So then the next year I took, I was advertised to take a group at Easter to Mexico City, and I got enough for three buses. And the year after that we got five bus loads to, to get, take them down and back. Then I kind of, once it was gone, I turned it over to the student council. And they could run the, the make the yearly trip to Mexico and back. And uh, so they did it for several more years. And uh, I started taking smaller groups in a caravan of cars. Because it seemed to me that when we went to the big city, in some ways it was like taking a bunch of students and going to Dallas. And everybody wants to go to a nightclub and get drunk. And I didn't really want to do that. I was more interested in having to learn something about the culture. So with a smaller group and traveling by car, I could get into the back country. And we could be in little villages and talk to ordinary people and get their picture of it. But I wanted students to know that what a great statement statesmen, a lot, some of the great political leaders in Mexico were, were really men of great genius and ability. And looking at the history of the Indian cultures and pyramids and temples and wonderful structures they had built and achievements they had made. So I, I was trying to help students to be proud of being Hispanic, that there was a great future it was a great heritage that they carried with them from inherited from the past, not something to be ashamed of. But the high schools didn't do anything. They didn't teach you a single thing that they helped you be proud of who you were. When you studied history, you learn about the great leaders of Europe, but you don't learn about any great leaders in South America or Mexico or the borderlands. And so it's, it was time to learn something about that kind of thing. And 
So I was trying to, in addition to my classes, to do some other things to help students to, to gain uh, self-appreciation uh, and pride in, in their heritage. And so I know a lot of the faculty administration were Anglo, and so a lot of the students at Texas a and too. Do you feel like they were supportive of their fellow Mexican-American classmates and the heritage you were trying to teach them and something to be proud of? Well, some of them, quite a number, were ready to do that. But when I organize trips, I get about as many Anglos as Hispanics that wanted to go. So there were quite a number that were eager to get a broader approach. But there were quite a number of others that were resistant. And I can remember one of the first things that we had happen here when we got Jose Angel Gutierrez and Carlos Guerra organizing students, getting activities going for Raza on campus, that uh, the student council and everything was pretty much controlled by fraternities and sororities that were all Anglo. And they, did, they wouldn't allow Hispanic members. And so they were <clears throat> um, trying to get, force these groups to open up that we ought to get Hispanic members in their fraternities. And also to loosen the control of the sororities and fraternities over the student council. They could include all the students and not just a select few. So there was quite a struggle. I can remember then President Jernigan called in the sororities and fraternities leaders and told them that he was going to have to limit their uh, power on campus, maybe even their approval to be on campus unless they became integrated. And they didn't like that one bit. They was <laughs> it was like pulling teeth. But uh, eventually they did. They organized a couple of uh, Hispanic and black fraternities and sororities. And they had a hard time getting them accepted in the inner fraternity council. But uh, eventually, and then the same thing with the election of a uh, queen, homecoming queen. It always been an Anglo girl. And finally they got it going for you could, we actually, after a number of years, had a Hispanic woman get chosen as homecoming queen. And uh, that was kind of like a great victory that had been for so many years. It was always, always an Anglo. So <clears throat> the, the uh, there was some resistance here. When they first started bringing Hispanic women on campus, the, uh, they put them in a special wing in one of the dorms. And uh, they, uh, there was some resistance to that from the Hispanic women. They wanted to be in, a, in a, any place in any dorm they wanted to be in instead of put in one. One interesting case that we kind of got our news at later, there was a dorm mother who had a uh, Anglo girl was uh, dating a young man, Mr. Gutierrez, from out in West Texas. And uh, the dorm mother called her in and said, you can do better than that. You don't want to marry that guy. And that's not a good choice for you, and I don't recommend it. And uh, she was the girl, the college girl, was very of unhappy to get that kind of word from the dorm mother. And she went and complained to the dean of women and, and there was some trouble over that. And uh, then eventually it got to the president and the vice president and the dorm mother was eventually removed. But that uh, young woman and the young man got married and he did very well at school and then he went back and, his folks owned a big ranch out in West Texas. And a number of years later, he became, he was named as a, 
as a board of directors for the university. So the man that the dorm mother thought was inappropriate, it turned out to end, eventually end up being on our board of directors. So change things, there was some change taking place. Right at first we had several restaurants that were segregated. And in the theater here in town, all the Hispanics had to sit in the balcony. And uh, the uh, students, when they got organized to do marches and demonstrations, picketed the restaurants and the, the theater so that eventually they were forced to accept everybody. And uh, then we have a famous restaurant south of town here called the King's Inn. And it's down on the beach. And uh, it's famous for their seafood. And people come from Corpus and the valley and everywhere to eat fish at the King's Inn. And I had gone there several times with my wife and we liked the food. So I had a friend from Ecuador who was visiting and I took him with me to eat some of this delicious fish. And we came in and got seated and we were talking. And since he was from Ecuador, it was easier for him to talk Spanish. So we were conversing in Spanish and we sat there 45 minutes and no waiter came to serve us. So I finally got up to complain that we've been here a long time. Then when I started talking English to the manager, and he, I said, I work at the university, and I've eaten here a bunch of times before. How come you're not sending a waiter here to take my order? And uh, he was saying, well, in your case, we'll serve you. So I didn't realize that till then that they didn't serve Hispanics. And so there was some pressure on King's Inn to integrate. And uh, they finally did. Now when you go to King's Inn, 90% of the customers are all Hispanic. And some of the waiters and managers are Hispanic. So times have changed. I've lived long enough to see it change. And it gratifies me a lot to, to see change take place. And we, we're pushing for that. It's nice to have a bilingual society that's multicultural. And of course, for a sociologist, that we kind of like to see that. So you identify as Anglo, correct? Yeah, well, my ancestors were Germanic. And I thought for a while I had some uh, Indian uh, heritage. One of my ancestors was a frontiersman. And we thought maybe he'd married an Indian woman. And we had a little bit of Indian in us. Then I joined this DNA thing and they checked my blood and I don't have any Indian. <laughs> so I was disappointed. But uh, I would, uh, I, I like the Hispanic culture and I enjoy traveling in Mexico and South America. And so I consider myself a sort of culturally anyway, uh, 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 as much Hispanic as I can be anyway. <laughs> And are there any other memorable events that you've been a part of during the Chicano and Latino movement? Yes, I mean, I'd like to mention a moment. There was, right here at the very beginning, the very earliest time, there was um, a lot of talk and news about uh, some marches and walkouts that they'd had in California and then in the valley. And so people here were kind of talking about that. And then we heard about some things happening in Crystal City. So it was kind of in the air. And then there was a young man here, a student, by the name of Efrain Fernandez. His folks ran a restaurant here, a Hispanic, a Mexican restaurant. And he was working with these high school and, and students, young people in the town. They were unhappy with the way they were being treated in the high school. And we were just then getting a, a underground newspaper going. 
in the high school and here in the high, in the college. And in the college, there were some of the veterans who had come back from <clears throat> Vietnam and other places to go to school here. They were used to being treated better than they were in Kingsville. And uh, Kingsville was notorious for segregation and prejudice. And uh, so <clears throat> the uh, one day, we, to our surprise, there came a march of <clears throat> several hundred young Hispanic young people from the high school marching down Main Street with signs of Viva La Raza and change the high school. They were protesting mostly the high school. And uh, <clears throat> the sheriff responded by arresting the whole bunch putting them all, packed them in the jail. And uh, they were arrested for parading without a permit. And so they were all in the jail and then people gathered around the jail waiting for the kids to be released or to hear what was gonna happen. And so it, the jail, the, high, the police station was right across the street from the post office. So a lot of us gathered at the post office. It must've been a thousand people all parents of the people who were in jail, the boys, the mostly boys. And uh, there was, the tension was growing as the time grew more and more. Later at night, everybody was work, getting more and more worked up. And it looked like we could have a riot or a, some kind of violence because of the, the parents were getting angry that they're sons were being locked up for doing nothing more than exercising their right to protest, the freedom of speech. And so <clears throat> then uh, Carlos Guerra was a student here, and he and a, a, another businessman, a Hispanic businessman, a real estate agent, an insurance man, went to the police and negotiated a settlement where the boys could be released in the custody of their parents. And so the parents would come and they release the son and then another one and another one. And there were several other folks that went and got the whole baskets full of hamburgers and brought to the jail to feed the boys in the, in the lockup. So finally around midnight, the last one was released. And the tension died down. But then the, the sheriff had learned that when you lock up that many young people, that uh, you've got a bigger community out there to, to deal with. And uh, that was the first demonstration we'd had in town that amounted to much. Then later we had demonstration at the Humble Oil that they weren't hiring any Hispanics. And then there were marches and demonstrations about the segregated restaurants. And then we began having demonstrations on campus uh, about one issue or another that the students were protesting. And they were working with the president. A bunch of the leaders met with the president for several hours and explained their concerns. So gradually it was becoming more common after we got Jose Angel here, from Jose Angel Gutierrez, from Crystal City. He had a lot of experience with protests and activities in the Crystal City area, and then he came here to get a degree. And so he had, he was active in getting students organized. And he and Carlos Guerra and a whole bunch of other leaders emerged to uh, to continue the the work motivation here. And I tried to be as helpful as possible to what they were doing, especially when they're putting out underground newspapers. I had a mimeograph here in my garage and uh, they, I'd donate the paper and they'd write up stuff and crank it out. And then we'd distribute the, they would distribute the papers around on the campus. And then, then occasionally they'd have a rally it's some nearby town and we'd send students from here would try to go and uh, 
Sometimes I'd take, I had a Volkswagen bus. I'd get a bunch of them in the bus and we'd go to the rally. We had one at, important one at San Felipe del Rio. And uh, a whole bunch of leaders came in from all over and gave speeches. And I took a bus, carload of folks up there. And then another time I loaned my car to a bunch of students who went to Woodsboro. And then two days later, the sheriff was calling me, wondered if I knew my car had been in Woodsboro, wondered if it had been stolen. And I said, no, I loaned it to some students. <laughs> and they'd taken the license plate and tracked me down and came back here and let me know they were watching. Then we went to one, one big rally in San Antonio. And I went with them up to that meeting and a whole bunch of us went. And they had Dolores Huerta come and give a, a bunch of speeches. And I was very much impressed with her. She was one smart woman. And everybody asking her questions, trying to trip her up, and she was right on the ball every time. Put them down, you know, and gave them the real facts. And I thought that's the kind of leader that they need, we people need to have. Somebody so well informed and so sharp and click, sharp in their minds. It's just really amazing. You had mentioned an underground newspaper. Uh, what was the name of that newspaper and what kind of effect did it have on the community? Well, it got apparently pretty widely read around on campus. There was, they'd come and they'd start and stop depending on what student was writing and when they graduated. And each time it came out, it had another name. The first one that came out was put out by Gary Bigger and his friends. And um, it was mostly protesting the way the student newspaper was being run. And that was called the RAG. But then the others came out with names like La Raza, and I can't remember all the names, so I can't. I, I you saved a whole bunch of them, every one that came out. I saved them for historical things. But then the years went by and nobody was interested, and I think it's finally lost somewhere in my stack of boxes back there. If I find them someday, I'll make them available to you if you're interested. But, uh, I kind of gave up on anybody ever doing any, any research on it. It, it. They did research on the, the movement here and there. One thing I wanted to mention that came to me, that surprised me, was the, uh, the reaction of the community, the, some of the power structure in the community. I should have expected it as a political scientist and sociologist, and somehow I was so caught up in what we were trying to do that I didn't stop to think that the sheriff and some of the people had a lot of these young men that were marching and stuff were uh, students but they were older age because of our practice of they put you in school and if you didn't do well they make you take the grade over and so there were a lot of young folks in school they were three or four years older than everybody else in their class and so they were old enough to uh, be interested in drinking and smoking when the others weren't. And then they'd get arrested for drinking, underage drinking. And uh, they were almost old enough to be drinking but couldn't. So there were a lot of them on parole. And the parole officer was putting pressure on them to do something violent throw stones and break windows or jump on a car. And so some of them did that up in the, there was a rally up here in Alice and a bunch of students from here. Uh, uh, they were kind of in and out students, dropouts and others. They were active in the movement, but uh, they were pressured by a parole officer and others to do something more violent. So then they'd get put in jail for breaking windows or destruction of property. And it was caused by 
they were kind of led into it, tricked into it. And I felt that was, I should have expected that. We should have warned the students, be careful. There'll be folks trying to get you in trouble if you're not careful. And that was most unfortunate. Here we are in a democratic society and then we got the, the law enforcement people <laughs> encouraging students to, to get themselves arrested. It was, I didn't feel it was, I was angry about that, that it was the wrong kind of thing to do. In the first demonstration that they had here, the student newspaper and the local newspaper were out with cameras, almost getting mug shots for everybody that participated. And I felt that's not news gathering, that's intimidation. And I, I didn't like that. And uh, next time they had a demonstration, I tried to get out and get in the way of the cameraman. So what you're doing is not news, it's intimidation. But they took pictures of me and said, this guy is against freedom of the press. So I was getting in trouble. They didn't understand what I was trying to do. So I had to change my tactics. It was, it was, uh, I'm sure that the dean had lots of pictures of me uh, and a lot of students that had participated in, in those kinds of activities. That <clears throat> it was, I think, most of, it just, it was, we don't always live up to our ideals as a democratic society. To preserve the old way at all costs, even when the old way is all wrong. Was there a specific time you like realized the disparity between schools, uh, either like it's like Texas A and I versus like a school in Austin or just a school outside of South Texas? Yes. Well, I think we noticed that right from the beginning. The, uh, it was part of one of the causes of the unrest. We had, at that time, in 1963, A&I was a state-sponsored university, and there wasn't anything around it that measured up. And so a lot of students were coming here, great numbers were coming from Laredo, and from McAllen and the Valley, and from Corpus to get their degree from A&I. And students that live along the border were used to a more open society. It, like in Rado, a lot of Anglos that have businesses on the other side, and a lot of rich Mexicans have businesses on this side. And these folks get together for parties and know each other. And there's a more acceptance and inner visitation and understanding. And in the Valley as well, in Brownsville and other places. So that you have a more open society and students coming from there to Kingsville and they couldn't go to the theater and they couldn't eat in restaurants and some of the professors were prejudiced they just uh, the deans and so forth it was uh, they were unhappy with it we had a, a big organization on campus known as the Laredo Club and a lot of the Valley students and the Laredo students were all part of that a huge big organization of uh, all Hispanic students that would meet periodically. And when they sponsored a candidate for a homecoming queen, then she won, because they were a big, big organization. But that was the beginnings of part of the protest that was coming, but it came from the disparity between the openness of the Valley community and the narrowness of Kingsville. And we should have been different as a university community. We should have known better. But we did have one thing I mentioned. We had a number of young professors uh, just out of university who were newly arrived. And so we had like Dr. Albro. Then we had a professor Cottrell in political science who later went on to become president of, of Our Lady of the Lake it in, in San Antonio and several others that were here that were here during this time and they were very sympathetic. 
So I wasn't the only professor that was sympathetic and encouraging to the students. They found a cadre of a minority of professors here who weren't the old gray-haired type guys. We were just fresh out of grad school. And we were eager to see A and I become more like UT or some other major university that is more cosmopolitan and not so narrowly ethnocentric. And so eventually Texas A&I uh, went on to become Texas A&M and Kingsville. Did the changing of the name bother you? Why or why not? No, I, I was kind of uh, not real sure what, which way I wanted to be. <laughs> The, uh, I could see the advantages of being uh, connected to a major university. The politics in the state meant we might get more money and better funding. And so it, uh, that had advantages. But then being an independent little university had some advantages too. And there was a lot of people with the tradition. They liked the name A&I and, I and it, it had nostalgic properties and so they wanted to stay with that forever and ever that uh, I was willing to go either way and I being a graduate of UT I had a certain uh, antipathy to A&M because UT people always make fun of the A&M people the Aggies over there and I'd grown up I'd gone to school there a couple of years I it was I wasn't real sure I wanted to become a a professor from A and M, <laughs> but uh, that had that was neither here nor there. I had my job to do here. And so, at the time of the South Texas Border Initiative, how did things change at the university? And was there a lot of new job opportunities that opened up? Not too much. It stayed pretty much the same. We had to go through another layer of bureaucracy to get our budgets taken care of. And there was more emphasis once we joined the A&M system. I think it would have been the same if we joined the UT system. More emphasis on research. And uh, they didn't want the professors in the community and spending time with students. They wanted you writing papers and getting grants. And so it uh, makes it more difficult uh, to be an activist and be a professor now. You, if you want to get anywhere as a professor, you need to get grants, write grants, get money. And uh, one or two of my students in sociology have gone on to get PhDs. And uh, they've come here to get jobs. And uh, unless they have a whole lot of grants and papers, they're, they're not invited to come here. So one of my students right now just graduated with a PhD and I was kind of helping him get a job. He couldn't get one here very well, so they got one down at uh, Rio Grande, UT, Rio Grande Valley. He's teaching sociology down there now. And they allow him to be more activist. So he's busy organizing ways to be helpful to the migrants. That, coming over. Okay, so this is my last question. Um, as far as the Chicano movement that goes in the South, what work do you think still has to be done? Goodness, I hadn't thought about that kind of question. <laughs> I kind of retired and let the younger folks figure out where they want to go next. I always been, always was trying to be helpful in ways that I could be helpful provide information or facilities, whatever I could. I felt the leadership of the movement needed to be Hispanic. They don't want some gringo telling them what to do, that they needed to decide for themselves where they want to go next. And uh, so I think um, I've, I've been interested to notice I, a couple of changes. The uh, When I first came here, if I said a couple of words in Spanish in class, a lot of my students could understand what I was doing. I could even tell a joke in Spanish, and they would laugh. 
And then toward the end, when I would say stuff in Spanish, nobody grinned. They, uh, it's more and more students come from second, third generation families, and they don't speak Spanish at home. They don't know much Spanish. And uh, they're not identifying themselves as Hispanic or Mexican heritage. They think of themselves as more Anglo or more mainstream American. So that the, when you get together the old timers and they talk about Viva la Raza, but the young folks have no, they don't buy into that. Not very many young folks. The younger ones could care less about uh, the old slogans or the old pictures. It's uh, something that's it's had its day from their point of view. And uh, that's, uh, that in a way, that's good because it shows acculturation is working. But in another way, I think it's tragic that a lot of Hispanic people don't appreciate the beauty of the Hispanic heritage that uh, when, when somebody who's Vargas or Benitez or Benavides or whatever goes to Mexico, they ought to have a feel a certain kinship and appreciation and uh, admiration for what they've been able to achieve considering all of the difficulties and colonialism and uh, economic difficulties that they've been forced into. And they've done right well in spite of all of that. And that somebody ought to appreciate that and say, well, you're doing pretty good for everything you've been through. Instead of doing like our president calls everybody rapists and, and bad guys, and just to name a Latino uh, migrant uh, marchers seems to scare a lot of Americans half to death. And so I think our whole country needs to go to school again or learn um, all the contributions that we have that come from the Hispanic heritage, that there's a, we need to appreciate that. And instead of saying it's all bad, it's, it's just no fact, no real understanding of the dynamics of what's going on. At least that's my point of view. But, I'd leave it up to the Hispanic leaders to decide what they want to do with their movement. Okay, well, thank you so much. That yeah. was wonderful. That okay. was great. Thank you. Very good.